All right, so we ended up with this uh, earlier, and now we're moving to another argument. So we've been speaking about the axiological argument, <coughs> which, if you recall, the axiological argument, which is related to morals or ethics. And now we'll speak about the cosmological argument. People say that the left-handed writers are the worst. I think they're right. <coughs> are you a left-handed? You write well? You write? <laughs> yes. <coughs> when I was uh, younger, we had, we uh, I learned to uh, write with the you know the ink pen. I, I, at the end of the day, I had ink all over the yeah, all the time. I was mad at it. Can, can we? So I, I developed. You know, you can left-handed people when they write like this. So I didn't like it because it sounds it looked crooked to me. So I, I developed my writing like this. <clears throat> doesn't sound as crooked. It doesn't look as crooked, but at the end of the day, so. so. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the cosmological arguments. Uh, <clears throat> Developed by uh, Norman Geisler. When I say developed, I would say fine-tuned, you know, because the argument of obviously was not invented by Norman Geisler. But <clears throat> so, remember where we are. Where are we? Does any credit students want to sum up where we are in our in our arguments? Because we've been arguing for 12 hours <clears throat> on the same thing. So I think maybe we need to remember. So normally, if you master the argument, it doesn't take you 12 hours to say it. Yeah, but I visibly don't. So. You see, you see, tempted to say something, but Pete. <laughs> can, can he hear? Can he have the microphone? Yeah, no, he wants. You want to, right? No. Okay, you go. Okay. <clears throat> so who wants to say? What are we? Okay, let me ask you questions then. Who are we addressing? <clears throat> unbelievers, yes, but which kind of unbelievers? Atheists. Okay, we are. <clears throat> Uh, what did we say uh, so far? We divided the arguments in two parts. The first argument is offensive or challenging the ambiguity. We've shown him the trouble with, the, with his philosophy. Now we are answering his questions. What do you say? What is your defense for God? Why? Okay. And then we're making that. And we said so far <clears throat> that the ethics, the values that we find in the world are one of the arguments that we want to talk about. And it has to be a personal universe. So that, that means if there is a personal universe, there is a God. The axiological argument, always debate whether or not we should start with the cosmological argument, the axiological argument. I start always with the axiological argument because, as I said earlier, I've been convinced that everything is ethical, even reasoning. <clears throat> so the cosmologi cosmological argument, <clears throat> uh, you know, you have the word cosmos in Greek and here and actually <clears throat> the idea is not that, that it's not about the order of cosmos that is that is a different argument that but that's the idea of the existence of the universe <clears throat> but he makes it I think more interesting by instead of talking about the universe he draws the attention to us as, as existing and contingent beings meaning that we have to have some kind of relationship to a creator and I this is why I like his form better than some other forms. <clears throat> so he says some contingent beings exist. Contingents mean dependent in that sense. Like, I am not life in myself. I do not exist by myself. I'm here because I had parents, and my parents were here because they had parents, and so, so, and etc. And ultimately, Adam and Eve were here because God created them. So we are dependent beings. And a contingent being is <clears throat> every being that is not God. Simple. God is not a contingent being. <clears throat> and if you want to have the official word, the different, what is the opposite of contingent? Contingent. 
Autonomous would be one, but that's not the official one. We want the official one. <coughs> Self-existent, that would be one, but that would be theology. Contingent is more philosophy. <coughs> and theology, if you really want to be very theological, you would say aseiri. Come from Latin a se, which means <coughs> auto existing, auto independent. But what is the opposite of contingent? Shall we do the hang the hangman? <coughs> independent. <laughs> Necessary, okay. Necessary, and some others say transcendent. But I think necessary is better than transcendent because transcendent doesn't mean necessary, necessarily. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so now we are talking about the cosmological argument. I'm just throwing some vocabulary sometimes because if you read some books, you will find <coughs> the, those words and you might need them. Uh, so you don't have to look for a dictionary. So we, we made a point about ethics, but we also made a point, remember, when we talked about the problems we have. <clears throat> if you are left, if you are an atheist, then you're left with, with one philosophy that is possible, which is materialism. <clears throat> materialism entails that matter exists. And now the question of the origin of matter. So I am aware of the fact that some Scientifics are saying, you know, that matter, the origin of matter is not a real question because, you know, and some agree this and that. <clears throat> but really, uh, to me, everything I've heard that, that counter the argument that origin needs, uh, the matter needs an origin doesn't make any sense because these are just theories that actually they are to cope out the question of where the origin of matter comes from. I've never been convinced by any of them. <clears throat> but anyway, let's move on with this. Some contingent being exists because let's say that people are saying <clears throat> that matter does not need an origin, which doesn't make any sense. But even if matter would not have any origin, there is one thing that requires an explanation is life anyway. So even if matter didn't, you know, didn't have a beginning, then life had a beginning in every model of, of, of uh, evolution anyway. So <clears throat> we're talking about life because we're talking about contingent beings. Some contingent being exists. You and I exist, uh, obviously, <clears throat> uh, except if you are a believer of solipsism, which is another uh, philosophy. <clears throat> All contingent beings must have a cause or explanation for their dependent existence, meaning if you are not a necessary being, then you have to uh, have some necessary being that has originated to you. I mean, so far there is no debate, because I think we agree that <clears throat> it's logical. Number three, an infinite regress of existentially dependent causes is impossible. That is very much debated. <clears throat> and, but I don't know if I want to enter into the answer. There is an answer. To, people are saying there could be an endless regression of causes, meaning that we don't need the first cause like God. But uh, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to explain that. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Can I have a book? Any book? Bible and book. All right. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> this is kind of a. I need you, your undivided attention. Uh, <coughs> This is the Bible, and you have page one, and you have this, it's upside down. How did you know that? Because there is no cover. There is no cover. Wow. OK. <clears throat> and you have page, whatever the page is. Well, let's see 1,000. <clears throat> so depending on how fast I read, I will get at some point to page 1,000, right? But <clears throat> the idea of an infinite regression of causes means that in my Bible, there is an infinite number of pages. When do I get to the end of it? 
Never. So the philosophers are saying that if there is an infinite regression of causes that produce e effects, we are one of the effects of those causes. When would we have arrived to today? Never. Because between yesterday and today, there is an infinite number of moments. That's why it's impossible that we have a, an infinite regression of causes. <clears throat> is, that, is that clear? It's not clear. I knew I should not have said it. I knew this. I'm <laughs> All right, so I, we're going to add another week to the class because, OK. <clears throat> Why do I say that? OK, well, <clears throat> uh, OK, let's try another one. Where is my pen? You, we, all done, we all done mathematics. This is, I don't know the English word for it. I know, um, hey, come on. How do you call that in mathematics? A line? We say droite, OK. How many points is there in a line? All right, so <clears throat> if I zoom in my line, this is one portion. I have dots, right? Infinity dots. But how many dots between two dots? Infinite number. And how do I get to one dot to the other? In theory, I can't get to a dot at some point because the infinite number of dots between dots means that will take me an infinite time to get to the other dot. That's the problem with the causes. Doesn't help, or does it? No, it was. If it was clear with the pages, then don't get confused with this. No, time is not concrete. Time is is, is something that is relative. I mean, if you are now, we have to enter into quantum physics. I'm. I'm <laughs> 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 we need to move on. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Professor Klicka to explain that tonight in a simple way. But, <clears throat> OK, how can I put it? All right. Um, somebody plays with a yo-yo, right? This is, this is me. You know what a yo-yo is? All right, I'm playing it. If it goes down and it goes up, it takes some time to do that. And it, dri it travels a certain distance. If I'm playing a yo-yo on a bicycle, it goes down and it goes up in the same time. But it traveled longer because my bicycle is moving. All right? <clears throat> That's the principle of relativity of time. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's time in itself and space and time and everything is something that, I mean, maybe too complicated for us to address. But the idea is that infinite regress of causes doesn't entail time in any way. It's just because time is in itself had to be caused by something. We say God, and, and the scientists are saying this is the Big Bang you know, that created time and space. So time is not the issue, because before Big Bang, they're saying there had to be some infinite causes, regressions of causes anyway. So time is not the issue. The issue is infinite number of causes and effects, not time or anything. So from one cause to an effect, to the effect being a cause to something, there is an infinite number of causes in between. So it's just, I mean, it's, it's simple as that is, you know, uh, if my bottle, my bottle is infinite, I will never get to the bottom of it. But even more than that, in a real infinite bottle, I will never get to the first part of it. Because for my bottle to be infinite, that part needs to be infinite too. So, the, what philosophers are saying is that for that to be impossible for us to have, a ch <clears throat> to have attained you know, the time we're in, meaning there has to be have some time, there has to be an amount of time. For us to be there at 8.30 this morning, there has to be an 8.30, and 8.30 has to be preceded by 7.30 and, and 7, etc. If there is an infinite number of minutes between now and, and 12.30, this class will never end. I will never get to 212. To That's the point. And some people are, are, are thinking, what? The class will never end. I was not told that. OK. <clears throat> Please don't. <laughs> 
just trust me. <laughs> no, uh, the idea, it's, I mean, if we can talk, uh, maybe uh, at some point around the table, and uh, I can show you some other example, but the idea being is that, <laughs> it's, well, number three has to be true. <laughs> trust me <laughs> and trust the philosophers who say that it has to be true. Because those who say that they cannot uh, be an infinite regression of causes, they are not Christians, they are philosophers. That doesn't make any sense, I mean. To get to a point as you you know as, as cause and effects, they have to be some. It's just the idea of you know the second law of thermodynamics. Not that it really. Is. Some people use it as a strong argument against evolution. It's more a strong argument uh, about the idea that there was some kind of amount of energy at some point that will decay. You know that is it. So the idea is that that very idea of the law of second law of thermodynamics shows actually that there had a beginning at some point. So even if there is an infinite law of regression before the universe, you know, for some things, we don't even care about that because <clears throat> there has to be a necessary cause for the universe anyway. Even if they would be right, we would need as necessary being a cause for our existence. So what would that cause be? And then if we add up that, if we add that up to the theological arguments that entails order and purpose, uh, as we will do later, then it adds up to the idea that the cause of universe, on top of being strong and powerful enough to make it, it had to be intelligent enough to order it. So that, anyway, adds up to the idea that the cause of this universe, our direct cause of the universe, has to have some kind of personal uh, person and intelligence and power. Okay? All right. <clears throat> are you still there? You are. Good. Where are we? <clears throat> Number three, an infinite regress of existentially dependent causes is impossible. We made that point. Therefore, there must be a first uncaused cause of the dependent beings. So what I like about this form of the argument is actually talking about us. And sometimes, I think in apologetics, it's good for people to relate to the argument that we are making. Because to make some point, there has to be some kind of origin of the uh, universe that is so big that we don't even understand. It doesn't relate to me. But for me to understand as a dependent being, as a contingent being, is I need to have a cause that is necessary, that talks to me, that speaks to me. This is what we want, right? So this is the formulation <coughs> of the argument. So what we said so far is that we need a personal universe to have any obligation involved in ethics. And the matter, uh, and, and as beings, we know that we have a cause. We've been caused by a necessary being. That's, we are building the arguments for there cannot be no God, that was the challenging part, and there has to be God, because we need an explanation for what is. So if you believe there is no God, you don't relate to what is. And if there are gods, it relates to what is, what philosophers call the state of affairs. All right? <clears throat> yes, um, microphone. We need to find a reward for Pastor Simon because he's the. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm. I'm just wondering: is this like too complex to really use on the street? And uh, the cosmological uh, argument becomes complex when people are complex because they know the argument that there has to. They, they, well, let me put it this way. No, let me. That was very finish. complex. I know. What you just said. I'm just. I'm just worried. Just, <laughs> no, just go on. Yeah. And no, I. I. For me, I've just kind of simplified it to this: is yes. that I. I tell people like I believe in science. Okay. Do, you, do you believe in science? Yes, I believe in science. Do you know what is the first law of science? Often they say, I don't, I, I don't know. I say the first law of science is cause and effect. Wherever there is any effect, there must be a sufficient cause. Yeah. And, and when we look around this world, and we look at all of the effects, including you know, the consciousness of man, including order, including DNA, including including all things, there is no, that the Big Bang is not sufficient. Chance is not sufficient. And I don't know, for me, it's hard for me to, I mean, I understand, I've listened to this argument and about infinite regressive, and I, I understand, I've heard some good explanations, but it's just not, for me, not so practical. Yes. <clears throat> if you want to make it simple, then you don't address number three. This is it. But the idea that I, ha I have to, because you will find some people who know about the, the uh, if you, because you are using the principle of causality with science. 
So if people study in, in university the principle of causality, they will debate that the principle of causality is actually true. So you have to know the answer. But if we didn't make point number three, and we just go with the regular arguments, this is exactly the one you made with science. It's the same, same thing. That we, are, we, we are there. We need a cause. And that cause you know, it has to be God. That's what we believe. <clears throat> but you're right. I mean, uh, what makes it complicated is when, but actually, you said they would be complicated for the street. It becomes complicated when somebody in the street brings it up. So it's not complicated for him because he actually brings up the, the, the arguments. So it's, it's important for us to know the answer because it's simple unless he brings it up. But if he brings it up, I need to be able to respond. That, was, that, that is what makes it complicated. Yes. Question. Question. <clears throat> I mean, we've we got to go back to what we talked about earlier in the week about the rational the mind not being rational. And I, and, I, and I hear that it sees these things, and to me it just makes total sense. And actually, the about the book, kind of, even though I can't necessarily express it. And I'm of the mindset now that the way God has set things up is he has set it up so that people who don't want to believe can rationally disbelieve within their own minds. And so, okay, if somebody's just going to be coming up with all these arguments against yes. what we're saying, then nothing we can... That's their choice. Yes. I mean, we think we've got to come up with the, the <laughs> final arguments that convince everybody. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, we made that clear in the class, is that the suppressing of the truth is actually <clears throat> in action, and the only way that the suppressing of the truth will be defeated is by the action of the Holy Spirit convicting. And that does not come from the argument. The, the argument shows the suppressing, but the defeating of the suppressing is up to the Holy Spirit. Pastor Okay, I have one question. This uh, not, on in, uh, not on the regression. <laughs> <Please>. Okay. <laughs> I make it anyway. <laughs> so, Stephen Hawking said that the uh, universe itself is a continent being because it's the whole reality and it has existed yes. eternally and, and timelessly and even time is just an illusion yes. so there is not just the moments of time like you said 7.30, 8.30 but and, and, and he back up this with Einstein who once cons uh, was in the funeral service and, and, and the widow of the, his colleague was uh, very sad and, and, and and he said, we shouldn't be sad because there is not such a thing like time because, because uh, uh, present, past, and, and, and future, they are all coexisting. And it's just an illusion. He's alive. So maybe you can address the question. But yes, <clears throat> I lost a lot of respect for Stephen Hawking when he wrote his last book. <clears throat> Uh, because he's making a lot of assumptions that he says himself in his book he cannot prove. And one of them is the major assumption that he makes is the universe is the whole of reality. He doesn't know that. And I think, again, it's pretty bold to say that I understand the whole thing and I can tell you, you know, that the whole of reality is the universe, period. I, for me, the book in itself <clears throat> uh, and the philosophy of... of uh, of Hawkins is destroyed by the idea that he makes the assumption that can be debated. When if your basic assumption can be debated, then your whole argument is, needs to go through, uh, it goes through also. And, and we said yesterday, many people make philosophy to escape reality, to say that time is an illusion, and somebody who is at somebody's funeral say that he's not dead really is an illusion. Nobody believes this, really, nobody. And he doesn't believe himself, because when he's, he has an appointment, he doesn't show up late or early. He believes, he lives according to the reality of who we are. And saying that is, is actually denying the realm in which we're evolving, which is space and time. He's, I mean, it's funny because in his older book, uh, A Brief History of Time, he actually makes the, a, a totally different philosophy. So he says he's moved on, you know, he's, he's kind of... But, it's interesting how scientists and believing scientists are telling you you cannot talk about God with science because they are not compatible. But they are excluding God with science, so they are making compatible. If as a Christian I cannot argue with science to show God, then he cannot argue with science to show that God does not exist. 
if he's allowed to do that, I'm allowed to argue for God in science too. Because making a negative statement about God in science is making a st scientific statement about God. So I should be able to make a positive statement too. Again, we go back to the rules that we set together. You know, it says, you don't get to pick the rules that you like. If you are allowed to do something, I'm allowed to do it too. Yeah. So you want to say something else about this? I, I think this is a very sufficient explanation because uh, Hawking's principle is actually leading to the absurdity of the life. There is no meaning of life yes. if there is such a thing like time. And, uh, and, and another thing is that he doesn't have any scientific proof for that. If he can even scientifically prove that there is a, a beginning of, of the universe, then his argument is done. There is no, 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 no proof for that. Yes. <clears throat> of course, he said that you know there is this infinite numbers. They can be plus or minus, so you can start counting backwards. But, but maybe it's just mathematical reality, and it's yes. not the real life situation. No, and I think again, you know, some people place a lot of the weight of mathematics, and I, I think it's very important. The mathematics are like science; they explain the mechanics of things. They don't explain the agents and the cause of things. So <clears throat> that's something very important. Again, we are entering into the, the discussion we had earlier about science versus scientism. Science as a place, scientism goes beyond its boundaries, meaning that science is the one that's supposed to explain everything. Again, you remember the arguments we made yesterday? The fact that I can explain how my phone works doesn't explain away uh, the, the Apple factory. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, I can explain to you how this works, so I don't need a maker for this then you're plain stupid if you say that. But people are doing the same thing with the universe. I don't need God. I can explain how it works. OK, where, where and why was it made? I don't know. Here we go. It's like the fact that you explain things and the fact that mathematics explains formulas and equations is just actually putting, mathema putting the mathematical forms how we understand reality. But that does not explain reality itself. You know, the fact that if I want to use that, that just, you know, if I want to use that as a pen, I just need to do this. And then it's a pen. I can write with this. It doesn't explain away the origin of the pen. I bought it somewhere. And somebody made it. Something, that's something very important. You know, it's, <clears throat> there is a great book. I will quote it uh, tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, it's kind of complicated, maybe if you're not a scientist like me, so it's, it took me a while to understand some of the things he says, but <clears throat> David Berlingsky, he's, a, he's a, 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 um, a scientist and he's an agnostic, but he debates the idea that atheism has the right to make scientific pretensions because he says atheism is a philosophy and science is not about philosophy. And he makes some great points in his book, and I will quote a bunch of them uh, during the class tonight and tomorrow night. David Berlingsky, uh, the name is uh, The Devil's Delusion. The complete, uh, I must have, uh, yeah, the devil's delusion, atheism and its scientific pretensions by David Belinsky. Pierre Guy gave me the book uh, <clears throat> and I read it, I really loved it. All right, if, is there any, any other questions? Can you write his name? I can write his name, yes, I can do that. Come on. Look at my bicycle. <clears throat> you think it's nice? I think it's nice. David Berlinski. <clears throat> you have his name on the quotes uh, several times at the end. 61, 62, <clears throat> 56, yeah. <clears throat> Are we good? 
Are we moving? OK. <laughs> All right. So this is <clears> the <throat> classical formulation of uh, the teleological argument. So theological argument, <clears throat> in, uh, and don't make a mistake between theological and teleological. Teleological is a different word than theos. Theos is God, and teleos <clears throat> has the idea of order and purpose in Greek. So it's the argument from order and purpose, or design. You know, some people will say design. <clears throat> so the universe manifests evidence of design. That is an understatement. All design demands a designer. That is not very much debated, actually. Uh, because if you, let me finish the argument. Therefore, the universe must have a designer. If you bring, <clears throat> I don't know if you met some people, if you read the, the, uh, the debate on that, but most people argue point num press premise number one, but rarely premise number two. Because premise number two makes sense. Premise number one is, you know, so you have, <clears throat> I don't know if you heard about uh, the Copernican principle or the mediocrity principle, meaning that the earth, you know, uh, <clears throat> you remember when the, in the Middle Age people thought that the earth was the center of the universe and basically that, you know, the sun was revolving around the earth. Uh, and Copernicus uh, finally proved that it was the opposite, that the Earth was not the center of the universe. I mean, we don't know that, actually, because you want to have the map of the universe, but the, we are not the center of the solar system. The, the sun is. <clears throat> so that's what we call a Copernican revolution. But from that, recent evolutionary philosophers and scientists draw a Copernican principle. <clears throat> and that Copernican, come on. All right, you know Copernicus, right? You heard of Copernicus. And they drew what they call a Copernican principle, which I like when they use the word principle, because it has some weight and authority. When it's a principle, you don't debate it. And <clears throat> it's other, uh, other call it the mediocrity. Mediocre, you know, in the world. Meaning, and I think this is even worse, because Copernican principle has some kind of meaning. There is a Copernican revolution. We, we went through geo, geocentrism to heliocentrism. That's a revolution of understanding how the solar system works. That's a revolution. Then we went from Copernican revolution to Copernican principle. That's the principles that went. Now we're coming to even further to the mediocrity principle, meaning that the, 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 the Earth is mediocre. It's, I mean, there's nothing special to it. And the only reason why is because we are not the center of the solar system. That's a lot of weight for something that's obviously. <clears throat> so the idea is that <clears throat> they're saying, and they're debating the first premises. You remember what the first premise is, is, is uh, that the universe manifests evidence of design. They, they want to dance. Uh, <clears throat> They want to take the, 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 the weight down of that, the idea of, of, of uh, the design by saying, you know, whatever, we are not the center of the solar system, we're not even the center of the galaxy, we're not even the center of the universe, right? So we are not that special. So there is a big difference between the movie A Privileged Planet and the mediocrity principle, meaning saying that we don't have, uh, <clears throat> we, we don't have, we, there's nothing special upon the Earth. But, that also can be uh, discussed, obviously, because design is there. And, and there is many principles, and we don't have time to do that. And it would be actually science to do this. But when you think about this, <clears throat> there is a few you know, words I want to I use, because I think they are very important for our arguments. One of them is what we call the uh, irreductible simplicity. <clears throat> when you, you know, some parts of, of, I mean, the smaller we go and we, saw, we study the, the atomic particles, the subatomic particles, <clears throat> the, the, the smaller we go, the more complex it is. It's like, you know, <clears throat> simple things 
are very complex. <clears throat> if, you, if you look at a cell, for example, a cell is very complex. But a cell had to have evolved from something in parts. But those parts to actually work had to be together. That's what they call a re irreductible simplicity, meaning that the complex part to even exist had to be together. Just the idea of my phone, you know, my phone to be able to make a phone call, there has to be all kinds of things in it. Like there is a SIM card, there is, there is a network, and a phone without a network won't, will not be a phone anymore. It would be just some, something useless. And it's, that's the idea. And that irreductible simplicity that we see in the human cells, for example, shows actually the design. Because for a cell to be able to function, it has to be a cell. It cannot be something else. If it's half a cell, the outside of a cell, then it's useless. If it's useless, then natural selection takes it away. So the irreductible uh, simplicity principle shows that there is design for us to be able to function. And I don't know if you know that, but you, every 10 years, you are completely different. Every 10 years, all your cells has, have been changed. So if you're 50 years, you've been changed five times already, totally. All your cells have been told, you're a different person. And that mechanism is very complex. And <clears throat> so this is what we call irreductible simplicity, meaning that even though they debate the idea that there is design, there is design. Is that the same as irreducible complexity? Is that the same? It's either one. Okay. Yeah, it depends. Actually, in French, we say, I translated it from French. We say simplicity, but it's irreducible complexity. It's the same thing, meaning that, uh, yeah, except that you call it a complexity, we call it simplicity. And simplicity means there has to be one. Yeah, it's not simple meaning it's, it's, uh, uh, it's easy, but simple meaning it's, it's just like God in theology is simple, meaning he's only one, that's the idea. But yeah, you might find it uh, in the English, <laughs> with the proper English translation. Michael Behe, yes. Okay, irreducible complexity. So you see the idea is that we're trying to show that the universe does manifest evidence of design. So there is many things we could say about this. Uh, because it's <clears throat> the idea that there is no design is actually a statement that does not make any sense. Uh, uh, so that complexity or that simplicity, depending on how you view it, then <clears throat> of the cell, is a proof that there is design. And, and you know, and, but think about this. You know, if we could talk a long time about the evolution, but <clears throat> if evolution is is true, then it, it has to explain a lot of things. Like for example, you know, <clears throat> for the eye, and that's one. I'm using the eye oftentimes because this is one of the arguments that. Darwin used himself. He was perplexed by the, uh, the idea of the eye being, uh, being an object of evolution, though he believed it anyway. But think about this, the complexity of the eye. To, I mean, every part of, is useless on its own. For the eye to work, it's, it has to be an eye, but it has to be connected to the brain. The brain has to be doing something about the information it gets. And there has to be a place in my skull to put it, and there has to be something around it to make it moist, and I have to be able to close it at night to sleep. All this complexity, uh, an eye is not just to see, an eye is more than that. It has to have some kind of complexity, and that, that is irreducible complexity, as Behe would put it, is actually proof that there is design in the universe. Now, people are saying, you know, let's go back to the mediocrity principle that we uh, spoke about earlier. <clears throat> as I said, you know, uh, <clears throat> Several members of my family are, are scientists, and one of them is an astrophysicist. And he wrote an article uh, that I read in Science Magazine, a uh, French scientific magazine. <clears throat> and it was very interesting because his work is actually to find life on other planets. Uh, not aliens, but you know, some, some form of lives. Uh, and it's, so, I mean, it is. I mean, maybe for them it, it is an interesting subject. I don't know. But <clears throat> what they are looking for is is um, where, because the idea is he's working on not to find right now life on other planets, <clears throat> but he's wor working on finding models to help us look where to find, we should find uh, life on planets. Because if you look at all the, pla all the planets, there is billions of them, so you need to find the better place where we should have life. So they find some, some of it. <clears throat> and they develop models in, with their computers you know, complicated models, because today there is no science with a computer. So they're looking around, and they actually found none. 
and which is fine because I mean they are just beginning. They've been doing this for ten years, so it's not long, right? Ten years. But okay, let's put it this way. Now, if you think about this, what I found very interesting is not the fact that they didn't find it; it's the fact that they concluded why they didn't find it. So, if you don't find life on other planets, what do you conclude? That there might not be life on other planets. Well, they conclude that maybe they made a mistake with the computer uh, model. That's presuppositions right there. That's what we're talking about. So the mediocrity principle has been defeated so many times. But maybe we looked in the wrong place. There has to be a mediocrity principle. It's not science. This is presuppositions again. So all this to say <clears throat> that even though the premise one is debated, I don't think, I think we can argue for it. So number one, the universe manifests evidence of, of design. That's what we discuss. All designs demands a designer. Nobody speaks about this. They are so confident about premises number one being defeated that they don't even debate premise number two. But now we, we've shown, I think, enough proofs to, to actually, <clears throat> for laymen and people we find in the street, to show them that there is design. And therefore, the universe must have a designer. Now. On its own, this argument doesn't, doesn't say much. But this argument, plus the argument, cosmological argument, plus the axiological argument, I think we made a pretty strong case for God. And not any God, as we said earlier, for the God we have and the in the Bible. <clears throat> so is there any question about this? Before I conclude on this and move on to a new subject. Did you write? They won't be papers. <clears throat> yes, this is what I want you to do. And that's a good question. I mean, what do we want? I mean, <clears throat> well, we'll see that. Are we doing, what are we doing after? I don't remember. <clears throat> we doing, oh, theodicy. Are we doing that? Yes, theodicy. Uh, <clears throat> we are going to speak about theodicy. Theodicy is developing a defense against the argument from evil that say that there is a, how can an all good God and an all powerful God exist in the same time as the evil exists. And I think <clears throat> what, I, what I will do is, is basically answer all the points with the Bible, nothing else. And this is what we want to do, right? We said that to be the, more, the closer we have to the Bible, the more coherent we are also in our apologetics. This is what we want to do. <clears throat> so yes. To know those things, I think they are relevant. As Pastor <clears throat> Devries brought up, he's totally right. I mean, I don't think I ever met somebody in the streets that brought up the issue of irreductible, you know, uh, uh, regression number of causes. I've, I've never met anyone. But I did meet somebody, friends and, and, and family members that do know that, and we had to argue about this. <clears throat> but I, I agree. I think the simpler we are, but we need to be ready for the difficult. This is about the training. But I mean, most of what most of the time, Pastor Steve, is, what he said was right, is that you won't find any people, I mean, intelligent enough to argue with you. And we go back to what we said earlier about the difference between knowledge. And they know things, and this is the good side of challenging. They know things, but they never process the thinking. When you challenge their knowledge, and then they say it doesn't stand, then you have a point. Pastor Pete? No, I, I mean, I was exactly thinking that. This is not exactly Roman's road. I, I, I just would have trouble on the, on the streets or even casually in a conversation to bring the gospel <laughs> with these last couple of arguments. I mean, I mean, just based on what you were saying yesterday, I mean, how, do, how, would, how would you? Or bring the gospel with this? I mean, you, 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 you were telling us that we should go back to the gospel and yes. the gospel first, but it gets a little difficult yes. here. Actually, <clears throat> not if you, this is why I remember before we entered into the de defensive approach, I, I, I told you to remember where we are in the arguments. <clears throat> if I want to sum, okay, I'm going to sum up in three minutes what we did in 16 hours. <clears throat> I meet somebody in the street, all right? I meet Pastor uh, Sam. Him and I, I'm presenting the gospel. And my goal, as you said, is to preach to him the gospel. He says, well, you know what? I don't believe in God. If you don't believe in God, then let me ask some questions. 
how can you explain, you know, we are, we are matter, you know, reason. I don't have to say everything. I can say one. Maybe just reason would be enough or ethics would be enough. And then he understands this says, okay, yeah, I see. Well, but I still don't believe in God. Well, this is what I mean by believing God. This is the reason why I think God exists. And I bring up my arguments. And now he's thinking, okay, well, yeah, maybe you have a case for God. Yeah, but let me go back to what we said earlier. And I go back to the gospel. Because at the beginning, I was preaching the gospel. The only, one, the only reason why I did some digression around with those arguments is because he raised up legitimate questions, to which I responded by challenging his belief and, and defending mine. But when I'm done with this, I'm supposed to go back to what I was doing earl earlier. So actually, we will be doing those things only if they raise the questions. But they might never raise the questions, so we'll never use the arguments. <clears throat> so I need, yeah, I need to, that's why I need to, to understand and master the arguments, because my goal is to know those things and be prepared, as First Peter three fifteen said, be ready to give an answer, and that answer might be challenged. If it is challenged, then I want the arguments. But if it's not challenged, then I won't need the arguments. That's the idea. But you're right. <clears throat> it's it's. Uh, I need to make sure, and that we've said it several times in the class. I need to make sure that I stick to my program, which is he needs to hear the gospel, and if he brings up like <clears throat> you know that that is. I mean, it is some kind of complicated arguments. But in a way, when you thought about it, when you process it, it becomes simple, and you can say it in simple words. <clears throat> As Pastor Steve showed us this morning, it's very simple to do that. But I've done that only because you raised up questions. And you remember what I said also when people ask me, how do you approach people in the street as an apologist? I don't. I don't, I mean, what I mean is I don't approach it any different than you would. Because when I go in the street and I give a tract and I, I Tell them about, about the gospel. I don't have any special approach. My approach is preaching the gospel. And then, but I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the debate. I'm ready for the discussions if he wants it. But my, my only reason why, the, and we also spoke about discerning if it's a legitimate question or illegitimate questions. You recall that discussion also. <clears throat> because if that's, if his questions will lead me to all that, but I sense the challenging questions just for the sake of the challenge, I might not pick up the challenge. I might say, you know what, God bless you, this is it, because I feel comfortable with that. But if I see the guy is open, and I wish I, I wish I would believe in God, but I don't have any proofs. Okay, let's talk about this, you know, and then we sit down and have a talk. But the idea is to to get away with the obstacle that prevent him to listen to me when I'm preaching the gospel. But I need to 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 go back to it. That's right. <clears throat> so Steve, microphone. <clears throat> I, uh, for me, if if someone brings up like this this point that there is no no limit to time or time is inf infinite, I I, I think I want to really ask him, bring it back to quite really, really you believe that, you believe that really there is infinite time in the past, and then and then maybe just mention you know that you know 70, 80 years ago that's what scientists believed about the universe yes. that it, e it existed eternally. That's what they believe. That was this consensus. And, and scientific evidence has proven that to be absolutely false. So they believe that. Why did they believe that? Because of presupposition they don't want to believe in God. Yes. And you're doing the same thing. So really? Mm -hmm. Really do you believe that? Yes. <clears throat> I like what you're saying because it's also, it's, it goes what we were saying about the challenge. You are challenging people's not only beliefs, but standing toward their own beliefs. Are you saying this because you want to, you know, get away with the discussions, or you want to, you know, or are you really, are you ready for it? You know, and this is what I like about this. That where we said, you are an atheist, really? Do you realize what it means? And then we go with it. Yeah, it's great. We need, and also again, you know, I'm, I'm just <clears throat> the way I'm presenting the class because I'm teaching the class and you're not. Thus, I'm doing the way I like, it. I, like I like to do it. But you, you might do it differently. So we're just making some principles. What I want you to remember is the principle we made. Now, the way you argue, if you present the cosmological argument the way Norman Geisler uh, presented it, that's fine. If you only present it the way the Pastor Steve presented it, that's fine too. You know, it's as, as long as you make it, uh, you make the principle. You know, there is as many formulation of any of these arguments as there are apologies on the planet Earth. So you can make your own as long as, as and <clears throat> I, I always say you can only use an argument if you understand it and if you can say it in your own words. If you don't, 
If you can, then don't. Just think about it. You know, read again, just go back to it, think about this. But if you don't feel comfortable with it, don't use it. You know, and as I said, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, this is what I said earlier in the class, it was on Monday. Basically, we were saying that, um, and, you know, we need to be careful with the limits of reasons and evidence and, and basically apologetics. So is apologetic necessary? You know, like if you don't have it, you can't preach the gospel. Obviously, we made a point very clear. It's not the case. I don't need to be skilled in apologetics. But the better arguments I have, the wider the scope of people I can talk to will be. That's what, I, that's what we're saying. <clears throat> and we are, you know, uh, thankful for the people like Ravi Zakas, William Lane Craig, as you, we spoke about this, <clears throat> you know, Alistair McGrath and some other guys who has the capacity to go deeper in this thing because we are reading the books and we get the arguments. But the fact that I don't understand an argument does not mean that, the, you know, I have to use it and find a way to use it. If I don't, I don't. That's fine. There's things I don't debate. People ask me, you know, you know, I don't know, I, I, I understand 0.0001% of quantum physics, and the only thing I understand, I use. But when I don't understand the rest, I don't. And if this is it, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Again, I don't have to have an answer for everything. Okay? Most people, when you meet them first, they have very little capacity for anything else but emotional decisions. So yes. that's how we all were, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Yeah. What I'm saying is, remember what we said uh, in the area, why do we address it? Because now we are just addressing your theism. This is it. We, are not, we have not talked about anything else. Because the, the reason why is, as I said, again, if you re recall the introduction of theism, I have two reasons why I'm doing it. Number one, number one, because I want to show you how you can implement the principles we've, we've been discussing about how to do apologetics. That we've done that, so it's, it's a way to show it. And number two, atheism is growing in the Western world and growing everywhere else. You know, <clears throat> I think it was 10 years ago, I was in uh, um, Togo, Lome, uh, to teach the class of apologetics. And it was, it, was, it was amazing for me to hear that the questions they were asking were the same questions that, the, uh, that I was asked when I was in France. Exactly the same questions. Evolution and atheism. And people say, you know, you know, and there is not as much atheism in Africa than there is, you know, uh, uh, maybe in Europe. The reason because people are more religious. But people are going more and more to university everywhere in the world. And in your university, well, you are taught everywhere in the world the same thing. And this is why you know, we're addressing atheism also. But actually, if, if it's true that 4 or 5% of the world population is atheists, then you, won't, you will find 4 or 5% of people you meet in the streets they will have to use this argument for. But again, the idea of using atheism as an example is to show you the biblical principles. Because if you remember the first hour when we spoke about the Monday morning, we said that the goal of this class is not to give you specifically arguments, but to show you how we need to be biblical in our approach of apologetics. And uh, we, we, we heard Monday the theory, <clears throat> and now we're doing the practice. How can we address you know, atheists by being biblical in our answer? And this is what we'll do in, when we do theodicy uh, later in the morning. Pesotero? I have come to this conclusion that it might be very wise to practice a few arguments. And the premise for that is, is this, that you know, we need to open minds. And, and if you are thinking about salvation, it's not possible for man, but God made an initiation and, and he, he became a flesh. So there is a principle of incarnation, or we are taking that into our own level, it's identification. <clears throat> so there are all kinds of people around there. So if I know two, three arguments, and I can see it that where the person is going and I'm comfortable with those arguments, I am using different arguments in a different situation. And I have come to this conclusion myself that teleological argument uh, if you're able to use it, you probably don't need to use cosmological arguments. Yes. They're a little bit interchangeable. And then there is a moral argument, yes. too. So, so I have a conclusion that if I, I can handle two arguments, I can pretty much 
assess everybody. Yes. And then we enter actually this emotional part and, and, and the most frequently uh, it, it is theodicy. That why, why there is a good God if it's so much suffering. And, and then we come to, to where we started, the gospel that it's a solution for so, suffering. Yes. And, and, and I, I really need to prove resurrection and things like that. If you're already entered that thing, I'm actually speaking with agnostics or skeptics, but not with atheists, but they are thinking about, I, I have heard like challenges, I, I know that you can prove that God is existing, and maybe he is existing, but I don't want to associate with him because of this and that, and yes. my brother committed suicide or whatever. Yes. And, and so, so, so I, I, I am encouraged to use a few arguments relating, uh, but, but they are just drawing interest. But, but I, I have found that I have never led anybody to Christ to using arguments. It's just, you know, I'm showing my respect that I want to meet you at your level and discuss about these things. Yes. <clears throat> well, if, if you want to have two arguments, I would, re I would recommend the axiological argument, argument for morals and the, uh, and the theological arguments. I think the theological argument is more effective than cosmological arguments because the theological argument <clears throat> implies that there is, there is a beginning also. And as the cosmological argument implies there is a beginning but doesn't imply that there is a design. So yes, if you know the moral argument, the axiological argument and the teleological argument, I think you're good to go. <clears throat> but you know, you said something that sometimes, and we can address that when we speak about theodicy. Uh, I want to conclude uh, <clears throat> first, uh, maybe uh, about the, uh, what we said so far. But uh, people are saying sometimes, you know, I, maybe God exists, but I don't want to be associated with Him <clears throat> because you know. And that goes back all the way to the Greek philosophers who who asked the question: Is is the good good because He is good? Or is the good good because God said it's good? And the idea being is that who makes ethics right and wrong? If God exists and is the creator of the universe, how can I disagree with God? I mean, on what ground should a human being who is created by God, if I admit that God exists but I don't want to be associated with him, I am making a weird statement. Because if my ethics come from anywhere, it has to come from him because he's the creator of the universe. So maybe what I think is right and what I think is wrong, maybe if God exists and I don't trust him, maybe he's playing with my mind also. So it doesn't make any sense really to, to, to say that I believe in God, but I cannot be associated with him because I don't agree with him. Well, how can a human being who is a contingent being disagree with God who is necessary? <clears throat> Yes, if you present the gospel and show who God is and explain why, why you can have a theodicy, why you can have a defense for God's justice, then you're making a point for this argument, yes. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's, um, let's move a little bit because, <clears throat> so we said we have two sides of the argument, we want to finish that and then we'll uh, take a five minutes break and go to, into the theodicy. But we, you remember what we said about the, the arguments, <clears throat> he said that they cannot explain the origin of matter, uh, even though they are only materialists. But we can explain the origin of matter with the cosmological arguments. <clears throat> they can, they can, they cannot give you a ground for reason, uh, you know, and make sense of life, though they are striving for meaning. But we can explain the order of life because we have the theological arguments. <clears throat> And then they cannot have, they have no ground for ethics also, uh, but we have an explanation with the axiological argument. So the idea when you oppose the two, when you're done with your challenging the unbeliever and defending your position, is you actually show him that the things for, for which he doesn't have an answer, we do. And that's what we're talking about, okay? <clears throat> so uh, there is two quotes I would like to look with you. I'm realizing I don't have it in my uh, screen here, but. Pastor Simon, can you read quote number 33? <clears throat> it's quite a long one, but this is the end of, of a, a chapter by Chesterton who is concluding uh, his quest to end, understanding for God. Quote number 33. I, I felt in my bones first that this world does not explain itself. Cosmological argument. 
It may be a miracle with a supernatural explanation. It may be a conjuring trick with a natural explanation. But the explanation of the conjuring trick, if it is to satisfy me, will have to be better than the natural explanations I have heard. The thing is magic, true or false. Second, I came to feel as if magic must have a meaning, and a meaning must have someone to mean it. There was something personal in the world, as in a work of art, whatever it meant to me violently. Whatever it meant, it meant violently. Third, I thought this purpose beautiful in its old design, in spite of its defects, such as dragons. Fourth, that the proper form of thanks to it is some form of humility and restraint. We should thank God for... Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quote. We should thank God for beer and burgundy <laughs> by not drinking too much of them. <laughs> we owed also an obedience to whatever made us. And last and strangest, there had come into my mind a vague and vast impression that in some way all good was a remnant to be stored and held sacred out of some primordial ruin. Man had saved his good as Crusoe saved his goods. He had saved them from a wreck. All this I felt, and the age gave me no encouragement to feel it. And all this time, I had not even thought of Christian theology. So <clears throat> what he's saying is that, you know, at the end of his, you know, intellectual, intellectual quest, he's, he's making some, some points. And one of them that is actually, without mentioning them, he's making the arguments we made. And this is the one last quote <clears throat> that actually sums up what he's saying later in, uh, you know, in, in his book. But he says, you know, I always felt life first as a story. And if there is a story, there is a storyteller. That's the way he puts it, that we need to, and I think sometimes, you know, one other I mean, advice I can give to you is know some of those quotes by heart, because I think people respect some authors and they respect some people, and quoting Chesterton, he's quite known actually, but not as much as C.S. Lewis or Tolkien and some others, but know some of their quotes, because people, they will hear you when you say that. <clears throat> so we're done with that. We're going to enter into theodicy, but I think we need a five minutes break before we do that. So let's meet in five minutes. Thank you.